So while y'all have been reading your Brandon Sanderson books, I read something about robot messiahs and talking jackals, and that was objectively better. So I'm here to talk about it. Let's go. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody. This is me doing a discussion of Naom by Lavi Tidar, which came out in audio yesterday. I think it's been out in print for a while longer, and... I think it's well worth your time, even though it's only a little time, because it's a rather short book. But it's fantastic, so go get it and read it. And this will be a little bit of, you know, non-spoilery stuff first, and then I'll um, uh, tell you where to leave off if you're afraid of uh, spoilers, and then I'll talk about themes that go beyond spoilery, uh, spoiler-free stuff. So that's what we'll do today. Um, let's get started. All right, <clears throat> Neon is a book that is in the same universe as Central Station by Lavi Tidar. Although you can read this one as a standalone because Central Station just happens somewhere in the background. So maybe go with this one first if you feel like it. And it is a far future, post-cyberpunk, almost magical realism kind of slice of life sort of story thing, which is <laughs> already hard to describe, right? So this this reminds me a lot of the things that uh, William Gibson does with his cyberpunk novels, just in a very different place, that being um, mostly um, so what is today Saudi Arabia, the area around Naom, and, well, in a very different, far future um, place. So that's that's sort of your setting there. And we follow a bunch of characters and through their interactions, um, we see a story develop. But that's, that's sort of the only part of the story here because really it's more about all these different lives that are intersecting, uh, coming together, um, moving apart, all circling around this place. And the city of Naom sort of is its own character in this kind of story, which does wonderful things there. Um, you see, I've been struggling. There is very little violence, so be aware of that. No action or very, very few action scenes. Nothing much around that. It just is a lot of fantasy, a lot of fantastic ideas, a lot of weirdness, a lot of poetry, and a lot of, well, that really hard to define atmosphere of longing, sorrow, and melancholy, with a bit of hope there. So it's 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 very unique in a way, and much more upbeat and uh, not upbeat, but much more much less aggressive than uh, Tidar's recent books like The Hood or By Force Alone, and um, it works wonderfully. So, I don't know, my, maybe just give it a chance, drink some tea or coffee, have a few hours with like 200, 250 pages, whatever, it's uh, actually long, and spend them in a possible future where a lot of things happen but humans are still very much humans and that's the great tragedy and also great hope of the whole thing. I've been rambling a lot here, I know, but believe me it's a fantastic book, it's got all kinds of really cool ideas including the talking jackals which is fantastic and um, well Tamagotchis and <laughs> other um, in the invisible creatures, digital creatures that also need love and a shelter and things like that. It's it's just a unique thing to read and I urge you all to do so right now. No stars because I don't give them, but yeah, come on, what you got to lose? Nothing, really. So uh, let's talk about <clears throat> themes and story ideas that may be deemed spoilery, but trust me, there's very little to be spoiled in this book. All right, I assume you don't care about spoilers or you have read Neon by now, so let's look into what Lavi Tidar is doing here and let's look into how he's achieving these things. Now, once again, I said this is sort of post-cyberpunk, um, by which I mean it is heavily influenced and uses a lot of callbacks to elements of cyberpunk that we kind of could know, should know, when we've read those books. There's clear reference to Philip K. Dick, a lot of them, both to Ubik, and obviously, do androids dream of electric sheep? Something that people often, sometimes call like the first cyberpunk novel. I'm not going to go into that kind of discussion here. I'm just saying, 
elements of that come back here because a lot of these stories as are a lot of the elements in at least later parts of the Sprawl trilogy and Burning Chrome by William Gibson, which once again is also heavily referenced in this story, are very much about like everyday people's lives within a society that has technologically advanced to all kinds of places, while certain aspects of human life are still very much the same or <laughs> have only gotten worse. And and in that tradition, that what you might call slice of life kind of thing, um, Naom obviously follows. Now, of course, a central station does the same thing in a lot of ways and has very little action plot in there. In fact, I would argue this one here has a bit more of an actual plot. But once again, the way we see that plot coalesce is very interesting because we don't actually follow our arguably main protagonist that much. That main protagonist being the robot. Um, but the unnamed robot, we still don't know his name, right? Um, so... We only see other people and see how they are affected by someone moving through their daily lives, through their, I don't want to call them small lives, through their lives that are basically just all of them trying to survive in whatever way, following their dreams, sometimes, um, sometimes just following, well, necessity. And we, someone, we, we see someone with an agenda, a very specific agenda, just walk through all of that and just you know, change the lives around itself, himself, whatever you want to call it. So I think that's part of the attraction of this book for me, is the people we share our minds with are affected by someone, but they're not exactly in charge of what happens. They they try to act within their specific area of, you know, capability, of agency, but that's a very small area in a lot of ways. And that's something that this book does show in an, in an interesting way. Now, I would argue that the book also follows, in a way, in a sense, the thing that we see in, say, William Gibson's Sprawl trilogy, which is even people in their smaller, you know, with their smaller agency, they try to do the best things that are possible for them, and most of them actually get their small happy endings outside of, you know, the so-called main plot, if you want to call it the main plot, right? We have all these people getting to do something. Even Mariam, um, you know, gets to actually at least spend probably an evening, maybe even a night with Nasser and Saleh and Anubis the coyote, uh, the jackal, um, get to go to space and have the potential of what happens there. Everyone kind of gets things within their personal, you know, capabilities, I guess. And that is something that we, once again, we also see in, say, the Sprawl trilogy, where people also get their um, almost happy ends, right? Even even all the way back, uh, all the way to Mona Lisa Overdrive, the people in 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 the house out there and get their um, get their happy endings, so to speak. When uh, I focus there, is it Henry Slick Henry Slick Henry, right? That's the guy. When Slick Henry gets to go off with the doctor, with the nurse, um, and everything, that, you know, people get. They're small lives, and, and I think it's important to read this book as well like that, because those lives matter. Those lives are actually what keep a city going, or keep a society going. It's, it's those people, people like us, that do the best they can. It's not about the, uh, you know, the extraordinary heroes. Those just walk through our lives with very little, with very little regard for what we need, what we need, do, what we can do, what we want, and so forth. They just march past to do their great heroics, and we're left at the side. So having this story very much focused on these things is, I would say, part of its strength, part of its attraction to me. Another one that I think is important here is, um, once again, the atmosphere and the poetry. There's a lot of, like, dialogues, especially with the robot, that are sometimes very poetic in a lot of ways. <clears throat> Whether it's the conversation when, when, the, when the robot shows up at the flower stall with Mariam and buys, well, gets given a rose, and it's that small act of kindness that more or less triggers, I guess, all the events. <clears throat> when no one actually planning to do anything about it, but, you know, small gestures um, have effects on us when we are 
we you know, get to witness them or experience them. And it's part of this book to show all these small gestures that make for huge things afterwards. Well, another thing is, of course, um, the idea of all these references we need to talk about. As I said, there are a lot of Philip K. Dick references there. The Ubik cigarette, which is a direct reference to Ubik, which is, of course, one of those fascinating stories that um, are very much about perception of reality and uh, things like that. And we have, obviously, the references to do androids dream of electric sheep? And if at all there's one big theme here, it is machines, in a way. And what we do once they are actually sentient and have the rights or don't have the rights of a persons. I mean, that's that's a question that once again we see all the way back from someone like William Gibson or, you know, Philip K. Dix, do androids dream of electric sheep. It's the kind of thing someone like Dan Simmons will never be able to wrap his head around because he's... Well, he's terrible. You know, it's it's that question, like, do they have rights? And is the way we have treated our machines pretty... Is that okay? Most likely, no. It's 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 abhorrent in a lot of ways, especially if we use them for wars. Uh, for, <laughs> I mean, we talk about PTSD and all the other trauma that uh, soldiers, human soldiers, experience in war. And the question is like, how does that affect machines once those machines are actually true artificial intelligences and have sentience? And um, does the fact that we build them, you know, make it all right for us to use him that, them that way. And I think that's that's a wonderful thing we see here, how that works, <laughs> especially when we have the, the contrast with Asimov's, and of course there is an Asimov reference there, with Asimov's uh, three laws of robotics, which, I don't know, don't really work that well, but the robots are making their own religion out of it. See, that's how they uh, <laughs> aspire to live, even though they're killing machines. How, how does that, how do those things work together? Can can spirituality come from that? It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. And the way it is explored, I feel, is great because there are no ultimate answers. It's just like that need, I guess, the need for um, salvation or at least the hope that there is, you know, an ideal to aspire to, that there is something that we could be better. And that makes those robots, robots very, very, very um, human in a lot of ways, doesn't it? And that's something that I personally liked. Now, the idea of um, the, the robot messiah near the end, now that one is absolutely fascinating. Now, of course, it has overtones of, you know, a robot diaspora, them leaving their homeland for all kinds of reasons, being, you know, pushed out into, like, the galaxy, well, not the galaxy, but the solar system, and some of them coming back and uh, w still waiting for their messiah. They are obviously... Um, echoes of Jewish um, experience in there, which is an interesting idea because what happens at the end, there is, well, one robot at least rebuilds their messiah. It's it's It comes out of themselves, out of their own, you know, group. And the answer there is love. And the fact that those robots are, those two robots are lovers is just, you know, Heartwarming in an interesting way, which, you know, comes back to you know, something that I said earlier this year when I talked about um, a version by Alistair Reynolds, the idea that true artificial intelligence, not even true artificial intelligence, may just face the same dilemmas that we face as humans, because the closer you come to full sentience, the more you are like us in a lot of ways. And that means ideas like love, emotions possibly a conscience and the conflicts that arise from us having to do stuff that we don't want to do um, are more or less inevitable. And, and, and that's at its core, the human experience, or in this case, the robot experience. Plus, obviously the line when all those robots leave and they ask, where are you going? And they're all, they're all combat Robots basically just walking bombs and ones like we're going to a place where bombs can dream of sheep. I'm like, yeah, that's that's a fantastic line right there. Obviously, you know, it's great. Um, but beyond that, I think there are all these other aspects, all these connections, in a way that I love about this book, and I did love already about 
um, Central Station, which is something that Lavi Tidor is probably one of the few authors right now that do that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and it's once again, the imagination. Now, the world of Central Station and Neom, it feels much larger through the small glimpses we get of stuff. Yes, I know Marsh and, uh, Morris and Martian Sands is also part of that sort of universe. And the idea of like their cities under the seas. We just know they're there. We haven't heard of them. There's Leviathans. There's shelters for simulated animals or simulated pets. And, and that's just... I just love the fact that they have this shelter that has like the last living Pikachu. And I'm like... <laughs> That's that's fantastic. That's just like crazy cool ideas. And, you know, the data vampires, all of these fascinating ideas that are never actually explained or explored because they don't have to be explained or explored. They have names that sort of make sense. And we're like, yeah, that's that's it. Um, that's enough for us to know and, and to give yourself as an author or the reader the license to just let your imagination run wild and... Don't ask for like full explanations of why things are the way they ways they are and all of that. That's that freedom is something that I that I really appreciate about both Central Station and in this case, of course, Neom. And it ties back into the idea of Neom as this place that is right now still very much, you know, an imaginary place. Now it's going to be built, possibly, who knows at this point how far they're gonna build it. And who cares? But it's it's that idea of a of a place in the future, a a place that is still very much up for grabs. We can decide how the future works. We can decide how that place works. We can use our imagination in whatever way we want, and we can have all the wonderful things in there, all the craziness. We can have all of that because it is an imaginary place. And I think that. That, that freedom that comes with imagining the future without restricting ourselves to all the things we know right now, because, you know, it's centuries in the future. Shit can go wild. And wh why shouldn't it? We Actually, an author going to, you know, sticking to that is unfortunately pretty rare in today's science fiction world. So I appreciate this one doing exactly that. Neom is a place for dreams. It's a place for all the dreams of people like Salish and, well, <laughs> Anubis, the talking uh, jackal. But it is also a weird place in that we know it is built in a way that does only only accept dreams. And I think that's that's the other strength of this novel, showing us that there, that clean, dreamlike quality comes at a price. And obviously our main character for that is Mariam, who works about like every job in this book. Because, you know, people have to live. <clears throat> and people have to make sure that the dream stays alive. And we tend to overlook those kind of people. And it's it's definitely a great way to go about this in in Neom for us to have, well, most scenes that we have, I guess, in most chapters when I look back at it are told more or less from Mariam's point of view. She's always there. She's She is the every man or every woman in that case. She is us, all of us. And we just do the best we can to um, survive, to get past, to get through. And we're bound up in all these, all these connections that we have made or have not made, all these um, responsibilities like Mariam with her mother and... We were, a f and sometimes we can show kindness, like she does when she gives Salesh and Anubis a night to stay, or these fears of commitment that she has when when she meets Nasser. And wouldn't it be wouldn't it be nice? But wouldn't it also be you know more stuff to do? Can we even afford more time for ourselves, or do we even have the time and the energy to do to have nice things? But yeah, that's, that's I think, is part of what makes this book so, made it so impactful for me to read. It's like, wow, this, this works. We have all the craziness, but also we have the same person showing up in all of these scenes because someone has to actually make sure things happen and things stay happening and everyone else can actually go about their more heroic um, adventures and whatnot. And yeah, that person of kindness that Mariam is, I think gives us hope for for the future because we can be like that and not be, you know, dickheads. Also, I guess we need to talk about terror art.
Now, I like the idea. So the idea of terror art is a very fascinating idea because, you know, multimedia installations, art and that stuff like that. Yeah, we have that kind of stuff. We even have a really, really dumb conversation in Hyperion, not Fall of Hyperion, with one of those um, artists, modern artists that um, Dan Simmons um, and his, through his character sneers at because, of course, they're all idiots because they're doing <coughs> contemporary um, performance art and whatnot. And he talks about like how war could be art. It's like, yeah, but... Please take it seriously. Look at what these things do and what art should do. And the idea of using violence as a form of art is, is something to be taken seriously and not something to be sneered at. Now, obviously, it is still abhorrent and it will come at a cost, not only to those victims of those um, actions, those terror attacks and whatnot, but also to the persons committing that. And the question like what those people could be like. And I think seeing that happen in the book All on the Side was just like a really cool thing. Like maybe I'm just like, because I just recently reread Simmons, I was like, wow, this is a comment on it. And I'm doing a lot of heavy lifting here myself. <laughs> I don't even know if Lobby Tidar has ever read Dan Simmons. I hope not. <laughs> but, you know, it does come to those kind of things. It, it connects in my brain. It connected in my brain. I think that's another thing that the writings of La Vitita and that a book like Neo, that is just, a, you know, a lot of more or less a collection of slice of life moments of characters, of people trying to make their living while events happen around them. And um, what books like that could be and can be is exactly that. They connect to all these other books m explicitly with the Ubik cigarettes and um, the, um, elect the Android's dream or robot's dream questions that come up again and again. Or a mention of an asteroid called Carcosa, which is out there with all these other creatures or weird alien beings that sound slightly Lovecraftian or in this case still Robert Chambers, Chambersian, is that the word? You know what I mean, Robert W. Chambers, um, King in Yellow, with the place of Carcosa. Anyway, we have the, those elements of cosmic horror out there, which once again tie back to sort of the idea that um, there are other intelligences out there that we find in the uh, the end of the Sprawl trilogy, when Wintermute, Neuromancer, whatever it's called, and the Finn and... The Count, Count Zero, actually leave for those places to meet those um, those entities. Or they're the weird lions and tigers and bears in Dan Simmons' weird um, I hate the world fiction. But the ideas are always connecting, and it's the beauty of books like this, that they are so open to latch onto all kinds of other stories that we've read before. Some of them old stories, when we have mentions of all kinds of old fables and fairy tales, or to new stories, to con concrete stories that the author really intended us to, you know, possibly pick up on, when Pikachus and all kinds of other, you know, digital pets show up, or to stuff that we do more of the lifting because we've read specific books and they remind us of those. And and I love that part because, once again, reading is reading is like a conversation, right? Reading is a conversation between all the books that we've read before in that moment in time that we are in when we do the act of reading. And that's more like life in a city is. We're in a moment and we run into all kinds of people and some of them we know, some of them we know really well and some of them remind us of other people and, and that's that's how human that's how human life works and at its core at its core neom is a story about human life and what it is to be human even if you're a robot and that that is a really really good thing to be for a novel right to you know let let the big adventure happen somewhere else and just focus on people trying to be people even if they're not fantastic book is what I'm trying to say here. Great prose, of course. I mean, great style. Lavi Tidar knows how to write, and the way he switches language from Mariam to the robot to Saleh and Anubis, the way he creates images and scenes of a robot burying a rose in the desert. Like that's that's iconic right there. That's that's beautiful written. That's that's poetic, but it also works as an image. All these things just show how 
how incredibly talented in his own very own way La Vitita as a writer is. And I really hope more people read this book. And if you have, then let me know what you think in the comments. And if you really disliked it, then you can tell me that too. <clears throat> and we can have a, a bit of an argument. Anyway, thank you for watching and listening. Um, thank you for liking, subscribing, sharing, if you did that. I would really, really appreciate if you do. If you want to support me some more, then, I don't know, join the Patreon. Uh, thanks to all my patrons who are already doing that. I really, really appreciate it. It does literally mean the world to me at this point. Anyway, thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.